It's a threat Iran has made before, but this time the stakes are higher. With the U.S. strangling Iran's oil exports, Tehran's threatening to shut off the Strait of Hormuz, one of the world's most important shipping lanes. But what are the consequences, not just for Iran, but the region and the global oil markets? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Kamal Santa Maria. When you think of important waterways in the world, you probably think of places like the Suez or the Panama Canals, vital man-made shipping lanes which transformed global trade. But perhaps just as important is the Strait of Hormuz, a choke point as it's known, through which 20% of the world's oil is carried by tankers. Now, the United States' decision to impose further economic sanctions on Iran has prompted threats from Tehran to close this strategic waterway. In two days, Washington will end all the waivers granted to eight countries, including the likes of China and India, that import Iranian oil. The US government says it's part of its maximum pressure campaign to stop Iran from destabilizing the region. This is how Iran's top general has responded. He said, we don't want to close the Strait of Hormuz, but if the hostility of enemies increases, we will be able to do so. Also, if our oil does not go through the Strait, other countries' oil will certainly not cross the Strait either. So let's have a look at the significance of the Strait in some detail, because while Iran presents itself as the gatekeeper, if you like, there are a lot more players involved. The Strait of Hormuz is the only sea route in and out of the Gulf that tells you immediately why it is so important. And if we zoom in down there and actually place a, a ruler over the top of it using the tip of the United Arab Emirates as a starting point, you'll see that in any direction, it's certainly nothing more uh, than 100 kilometers before you hit land, be it the Iranian mainland there, or one of these islands over here. Now, in this case, 56 kilometers of water sounds like a decent amount of space, but the actual shipping lanes are only three kilometers wide in each direction. And it was in the first half of 2018, in fact, that 17.4 million barrels of oil a day went through those lanes, around a fifth of the world's oil consumption, uh, coming from places like Iran, obviously, but up here uh, in Iraq and in Kuwait as well. Uh, further down, you've got Qatar, of course, which is the largest exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas in the world. Its exports have to go through the Straits as well. You go down into the United Arab Emirates, into Dubai, and here you've got Jebel Ali, the largest port in the Middle East, which handles up to 19.5 million shipping containers a year. They all go through the Strait of Hormuz. And don't forget as well, if we come further west again, based here in Bahrain, in this little bay here, you've got the US Fifth Fleet, America's naval presence in the Gulf, which can be deployed in the case of any heightened tensions. So let's introduce our panel to you today, starting in Tehran with Mohammed Islami, who is a political researcher and columnist. In London, Manusha Takin, an independent oil and energy consultant, and on Skype, from Lancaster in the UK, it is Simon Maybon, Senior Lecturer in International Studies at Lancaster University. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Welcome to Inside Story. Mohammed Aslami, I'm going to start with you in Tehran. And I do want to start out by pointing out that this is not a new threat. Iran has made the threat before, most notably, I think it was 2008 and 2012 as well. In your view, what is different this time? What makes it more crucial, more important, or as I said at the start of the show, the stakes being higher? Okay, first of all, I want to mention that it is not only a political threat, it is also an experience for Iran because the Iranian government has the experience of uh, putting some restriction and controlling the Strait of Hormuz during the Iran-Iraq war in 1980s. So this time, by, uh, as, the, as the consequences of uh, US policy and uh, quitting the JCPOA, the Iranian government is thinking about this decision as a means of, uh, I mean, um, uh, think, sending the message to the, to the United States that this, is, this time it would be really different for Iranians. But it's a provocative move, isn't it? And, and it, it's, it's a, a retaliatory move as well. I wonder about 
what it really achieves, other than showing Iran's strength and Iran's importance in the region, what does it really achieve? No one, no one really wins out of it, not in the region they don't. Okay, you know, it would not be, for sure, it would not be the first step by the Iranian government. It would be the second step, uh, step after uh, the, uh, any step by the United States. If the United States could not uh, achieve their goal to uh, put the Iranian export to zero, the Iranian would not close the door, close the gateway. Mm. But if they are really serious and putting restrictions on Iranian export, it would be the next step, the second step for Iranians. So the Iranians do not want to close the gateway. Okay, Simon Maybon, let's bring you into the conversation. Now, first of all, your thoughts on whether this actually could happen this time. As we've discussed already, it's happened before. It's been threatened in more recent history this time around. Look, I think that if we look over, over history, recent history and, and less recent history, we know that Iran does this when it feels like it's being backed into a corner, when it feels like it has very little other alternatives as a means of articulating its, its position and as a show of strength. So... Given that and looking at history, it seems unlikely that Iran would do that this time. But of course, we can never say never. We've got an increasingly belligerent and increasingly anti-Iranian president in the White House. And that has had an impact, I think. It has pushed Iran to the margins. It has pushed Iran from, from the center of regional politics. And it, it's created a sort of isolationist sentiment. So things have changed. The context has changed. But I think the, the outcome of whether Iran will close the straits, I, I can't see it happening, to be honest, but that doesn't rule it out. Just on a, a sort of a mechanic side of things, and maybe I might have to ask one of our other guests as well, but how, we, we keep using this phrase, Iran would close the Strait of Hormuz. How do you close the Strait of Hormuz? <laughs> how do you well, physically do that? <laughs> There's a number of different ways, and, and I think it depends on how seriously the Iranians wanted to close it. And the most obvious is perhaps mining the strait, putting, putting seaborne mines there that would obviously have a pretty damaging impact if any of the large freighters were to, were to hit it. Less obvious perhaps would be to have, have boats patrolling the strait, potentially shooting, shooting some type of torpedo or weaponry at at these freighters if Iran was, was serious about closing it. Mm. Now, there's a deterrent dimension, I guess, to, to any closure efforts. The language is a deterrent. But then if Iran was to actually go ahead and close it, you have different, different typologies of closure, I guess, depending on how serious Iran was and depending on what Iran wanted to achieve from this closure. Okay, just before I bring in Manusha Takin, just stay there for me, Manusha. I just want to ask Mohammed in Tehran quickly, your thoughts quickly on, on how you think Iran would actually enact this if it did. You know, for Iran, it is not uh, required to close all the gateway. As I, as I mentioned, uh, when we see the experience of Iran during the iran Iraq war, they didn't close the, all the Strait of Hormuz, but they put some restrictions for the tankers to go across the strait. Mm. So I don't think that the Iran would have any plan to uh, close the gateway in a moment. No? Because, you know, after all, the Iran would think about the plan to reopen the strait. So uh, if the Iran would be in a point to really put restrictions on the strait of Hormuz, they will, they will uh, not close it at, in a moment. Manusha Takin in London is our oil expert. Let's bring him in. This is central, obviously, the effect on the oil markets. Um, already there are a number of countries who will stop receiving Iranian oil. The United States says it'll be fine. We'll keep the markets supplied. There'll be no gap. Do you agree with that? Or is it just the, almost the symbolic nature of something like this potentially happening, which is enough to spook the markets? Well, the United States is playing the bully, is the, the only superpower in the world, so it can say and do, at least thinks, President Trump, what he can do. He says whatever. But in practice, uh, Iranian oil exports have not ceased in the past. In uh, 2008 and 12 and so on, President Ahmadinejad, at that time there were sanctions by Europeans and the United Nations as well as the United States. And yet Iran managed to export its oil, about a million, a million and a half uh, 
through ways and means. So it will be the same thing this time. Uh, plus the fact that Europeans have not put sanctions on, on Iran. Mind you, their oil companies, European oil companies, again, because of the strong arm twisting by United States, they are a bit afraid to purchase Iranian oil, although their governments tell them, European governments tell them, go ahead and do, but they are afraid because the United States might put uh, uh, pressure on them or would not allow and stop their operations in the United States mm. and so on. And isn't so that it will the affect this Iranian time oil Malaysia. exports. Isn't that but, the but I don't think it will. Sorry, uh, Yes, go ahead. So your say, question was? Yeah, isn't that the difference this time that the US is undeniably putting more pressure on, on the oil markets, on the oil exports, and sort of there's a, there's a threat in the background as well that, oh, well, we'll see what happens here and we might have to do more, and who knows what more is after that? Well, really, it is, this is a, a, a political question that the world and the European Union uh, which is telling its oil companies, go ahead and do not listen to the United States threat, threats because you are doing illegal trade buying oil from Iran. But they are afraid of doing it. It depends on how far this political pressure from the US and the resistance in uh, Europe will go. And then uh, we should also be uh, realistic that other countries, India, China and others, who do import Iranian oil, South Korea and, and our, our very much Japan, they would observe the United States pressure much more leniently, more quickly. But one would think that maybe China and, and India and, and others might resist, and their resistance would depend on other trades that they are having with Iran and the negotiations that they have all the time. Now in the United States and Chinese international trade negotiation, they might use Iran as a pawn, give and take. So uh, they all give in. The, so it's all a political question on, on that. And I'm no expert on politics. But I think these countries will come out of their way as they are doing behind the scene diplomatically and protesting. They are protesting to the United States, Indians, that, look, we have these refineries. We, are, we need oil. And we have had our refineries designed for Iranian crude in Madras refinery here and there for decades. Now you want us to change. It will be costly for us, et cetera, et cetera. It is that political pressure that they would stand against the US uh, belligerents on this issue, which I am no expert. But I think they will go uh, and, and start protesting. And they won't listen just calmly and quietly. Mm. The Chinese uh, on, on one side as well. And, uh, and there is, you see, you don't, President Trump wants to have the price of oil to be cheap yeah. because the petrol and gasoline in the United States mm. to be cheap so that they, he would be, uh, remain popular. Yeah. But of course, if the price goes up internationally, the domestic prices will also go up. It is, he's doing, he says that I'm, I'm telling OPEC to produce more. Yeah. And I'm not sure that in spite of the strong arm and the good relations between Saudi Arabia and the United States, whether Saudi Arabia would close uh, and, and uh, listen immediately. You see, in the uh, Let's, in autumn, I'm going to jump in, in Manusha. I'm going to jump in, Manusha, because I want to bring in Simon at this Please, point, because as, as you've so pointed out, uh, you, I mean, you're our oil expert. Simon is our international relations uh, expert. And maybe you can expand a bit more on what Manoush is saying there, because he made a really good point that this goes well beyond the region. All those countries I listed earlier, Iran and, 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 and Kuwait and, and Qatar and all of this, it, all those customers which Iran had, how do you feel they will react? Would they stand up for Iran? Would they insert themselves into this, what is essentially a US-Iran battle? I think what we've got to do is contextualise each and every one of these relationships so not only do we need to look at the relationship that Iran has with India, with Russia, with Turkey, with China, with South Korea, et cetera, but we also have to look at those relationships with the United States. So India's relationship with the U.S., China's relationship, et cetera. And it's those relationships, the nature of those relationships and, and the quality of them, the strength of them, if you will, that will determine the extent to which those states will push back against any U.S. efforts to, to try and create a, a position vis-à-vis -vis Iran. And so if there is some type of friction in that, type, in that relationship, say the, the Indian position, Modi's position with regard to the U.S. isn't quite on the same page as Trump, then it could well be that, that India pushes back and says, no, we will not do this. We want to, we want to continue with our infrastructural developments built around Iranian oil, and we don't want to be uh, pushed around by the U.S. 
And that's the same with all of the other all the other states that Iran is trading with. They all have their own relationships, not only with Iran, but with the US and other states as well. So we need to look at this, we need to contextualize each of these relationships. And by doing that, we're better able to see the extent to which those states might push back against the US. Gosh, it's really complex, isn't it? Um, I want to bring things back to Iran a little bit. Let's do this with Mohammed in, in Tehran. I want to get a feel from you of the Iranian people, what they think about all of this, because we characterize it as a battle between two governments. But in the end, it would be the Iranian people who would feel the effects. Now, let's play this out here. Let's say that Iran takes some sort of action. It retaliates. It closes the Straits of Hormuz. Tell us about the effect on Iran, the Iranian people, the Iranian economy. OK. First of all, let me say something else. Um, for Iranian mindset, closing the Strait of Hormuz, it is not an instrument in terms of economy or politics. Mm. It is a reaction to a kind of military threat by some uh, powers in the region. By re-electing the Bibi, I mean, they're re-electing Netanyahu in Israel. And uh, the amount of support from Donald Trump uh, for the Netanyahu and also some signs in Saudi Arabia, Iranian uh, government talking about closing the Strait of Hormuz may be a response to some scenarios of targeting Iran, attacking Iran uh, by, by some people, by some government in the region with the support of the United States. So for the Iranian people, it is also the same. You know that the uh, United States government put IRGC's name under a list of uh, terrorist groups, something like this. But at the same time, we saw lots of uh, Iranian oppositions, I mean political oppositions to the government, they were supporting IRGC. It was really interesting that lots of them, some of them also, some of them are even now in the jail, but they mm. have tweeted in support of IRGC and they said that this is a national army and the United States cannot put a national army in a list of terrorist groups, something like this. So mm. uh, I think if the Americans uh, change the situation in a way that the Iranian government would practically think about uh, closing the gateway, it will have the support from the Iranian people because Trump showed that he is not also only threatening the government. Also, Mr. Pompo, the Secretary of State of the United States, said mm. that the sanctions would have negative effects on the uh, life of ordinary people. It means that we are putting uh, sanctions also on the Iranian people, ordinary people. Do you so have concerns, in Mohammed, this situation, about the any, Iranian... Do you have concerns about any confrontation, the potential for confrontation, regardless of what action Iran takes? You made the very good point that uh, the IRGC, the, the, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, has been designated a terrorist organisation by the United States. As I pointed out, you've got the Fifth Fleet there as well. It seems like there's a, you know, there's almost a platform there for there to be problems in, in the Gulf itself, in the, in the waters of the Gulf. Yeah, you know, by, by the means of, as a consequence of this decision, uh, the risk of some kind of military confrontation is now high, and it is because of the U.S. decision. So, uh, yes, uh, it, 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 it is a real practical factor if you put the uh, army of Iran, which is controlling the Strait of Hormuz, you can, I, I should, I should uh, mention that the Strait of Hormuz is under the control of IRJC Navy, not, mm. the, not the National Army. So um, any confrontation between the possible uh, American uh, military persons and uh, the IRJC persons would be um, a, a, a confrontation between two groups that are designated as terrorist group by all the two governments, because you know that the Iranian uh, parliament also put uh, the, the American um, officers here in the Persian Gulf as the terrorist group. Mm. Manusha Takin, let's bring your economic mind back into this. A lot of what we are discussing is all in hypotheticals of what could happen if the Strait of Hormuz was closed, when Iranian oil exports are, bland, are banned completely. But take me through the process of what you think could happen, the effect on, as I was asking Mohammed, the Iranian economy, but the Gulf region as well, which could be paralysed by the straits being closed, and then the wider global oil markets as well. 
Well, the global oil market, uh, using your own terminology, will become, uh, 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 will we fall into a disarray. As you mentioned, the order of magnitude, 17, 18 million barrels per day oil going into the international supply chain, suddenly uh, stopping and disappearing out of the 100 million or 90 million barrels per day oil, or out, this is more important, out of the about 65 million barrels per day traded oil. Mm. That is very significant. Nothing can replace it. I have been reading that uh, here and there. Analysts talk about the pipelines crossing across Saudi Arabia, pipelines in the United Arab Emirates, which go and bypass the Strait of Hormuz. But all these, for example, may be one and a half, 1.4, 1.3 million barrels per day for in one case. In Saudi Arabia, going to Yanbu, the Red Sea ports are something like four and a half million barrels per day the capacity, as in probably the, what is available, maybe about three million barrels per day. And the Iraq pipeline going through Turkey is not operational and maximum mm. would be 300,000 barrels per day. So there is, in fact, no other way to get this oil out, and it is uh, not replaceable. The price of oil will shoot in the sky, honestly. It is not a, a thing that one can talk about. Uh, okay, uh, some oil sellers, oil companies, individuals, and so on might profit on a short-term basis, but I think the whole economy in, in the world, will, will, there's the threat of, of collapse. There is, for example, in the uh, International Energy Agency, the in the agency of the industrialized world. Mm -hmm. They have a system in place for emergency rationing in case of disruptions like this. But that is still limited. And the plan, emergency plan distribution and so on, it is only for the industrialized company, Japan, Australia, mm -hmm. and Europe, and United States and Canada. And they can replace, say, about 10, 12 million barrels per day for about a month. And then out of their strategic reserves, out of the commercial reserves, and then uh, in the second month, probably will eight, and the third month will be five. And in, within six months, their strategic reserves can only give about one million, two million barrels per day wow. oil to these industrialized countries. Whereas you have the rest of the world outside this Europe uh, and the Far East, yeah. uh, the OECD countries and the United States, all the developing countries, Asia, Latin America, and, and Africa, and so on, India, the order will be hungry for oil. This yeah. is, and the, uh, it is just unthinkable. I can't really think of how it, it just shouldn't happen. It can't happen. OK, and you've led nicely to my final point, because we're just starting to run down the clock. It strikes me that the three of you, the four of us, effectively, have mapped it all out. And presumably, people in much higher positions than us have mapped this out too. And yet, we still seem to be stumbling towards some sort of uh, confrontation or escalation. Simon Maybon, what is the best way out of a situation like this, given the US really doesn't want to play ball, doesn't want to negotiate? What, in your opinion, is the way out? Diplomacy. But then again, I would say that being the director of a peace institute. Diplomacy seems to be the only way out of these types of issues. But, but this is what is happening. This, what we're seeing with this current crisis is a consequence of diplomatic channels being shut down and and all avenues for diplomatic dialogue and dialogue generally being shut down in the US with regard to Iran. And as a consequence, it's backed Iran into a position where it, it seems unable to actually facilitate any type of other movement than to, to resort to this type of defensive posturing. Now, I, I don't think it will happen. I think that the, the, scale, the stakes are too high for everyone involved, and there will be some type of creative diplomatic solution. Perhaps the Omanis might do some type of mediatory role or something like that. But this is what happens when you start to put a squeeze on a state and you start to attack the institutions of that state uh, by prescribing them the terrorist entities. And it, it really is a worrying situation when diplomatic avenues have been squeezed to this point, and it creates a, clim a climate where any type of, of situation, any type of action from all manner of different actors mm. could provoke something, whether this is a desired uh, consequence or not. Such heightened tensions mean that actions can be misconstrued, means that certain things can, yeah. be, can become combustible yeah. elements. Stakes are incredibly high, aren't they? And it's been really interesting talking to the three of you about it. Mohammed Aslami, Manusha Takin and Simon Maybon, thank you for joining us. And thank you as well for watching. Plenty more for you online this episode. All our others are at aljazeera.com in the show section. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. Twitter 
is at AJ Inside Story. I'm Kamal AJE if you want to tweet me directly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kamal Santamaria and we will see you again soon. Thank you.